Greetings, everyone, once again, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And I am back to bring you another chapter in the Humanity of Christ book by Brother James W. Knox. He is my pastor, and you can find this book and many others on the church website at www.jameswknox.org. So, so far we've covered the introduction in the first three chapters, and you can go back and uh, listen to those Facebook Live scopes, and I encourage you to get the book and read it for yourself. Amen. <clears throat> and get any extra notes that you may get from these lessons, and today we're going to be covering chapter 4, which is the Ascension of Jesus. This is a long chapter. It is 70... It is from page 59 through 72, so I try to read the whole thing in one sitting, but uh, maybe have to break this down into two parts, uh, but we'll see. Hopefully we can do the whole thing. I know these uh, videos seem extensive, but extensive is good because we need the truth, amen? So let's get started. Chapter 4, The Ascension of Jesus, and it starts here. It says, the verse with which we begin or began our studies carries us all the way to the ascension of Jesus reading 1st Timothy 3:16 once again we are reminded and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the gentiles believed on in the world received up into glory he left glory, he lived in glory, he died in glory, and then was received up once again into glory. Hallelujah. Proverbs 30, verse 4 says, Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? <clears throat> this verse speaks of ascending into heaven. Since the fall of Adam to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we read of a few men being taken to heaven by the power of God under supernatural, miraculous circumstances. Right. In Genesis 5.24 we read, And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. That man was translated by the power of God. He was taken from earth to heaven without going through the doors of death. What a wonderful thing. Amen. In the closing chapters of Deuteronomy, we read of the death of Moses, but it is not until Jude 1, 9 that we learn how Michael the archangel came down to retrieve the body of Moses. There was a dispute between the me that messenger and the devil. The former said, The Lord rebuke thee. And Moses was taken by the power of God to heaven prior to resurrection day in advance of his appearance on the mount, of which we read in our last chapter. Second Kings 2, 1-11 tells of Elijah walking with God and Elisha following close behind, trying to keep up, when a chariot of fire caught away the great prophet and a whirlwind carried him un into heaven. And I see just going and reading that, uh, those chapters, or that chapter, Second Kings 2, 1 through 11. It's a good, good chapter. Amen. <clears throat> the whole Bible's good. All right. So we continue on. It says, Notwithstanding all, all these unusual events, no man ever left earth, traveled to heaven, entered through those gates, and was welcomed into that holy place by his own power, by virtue of his own merit, for none had sufficient righteousness to do so. Right. The Proverbs 30 verse 4 passage asks if we tell the name of one who has ascended or the name of his son who has ascended. We search from Genesis through Malachi and almost to the close of the gospel records and in 4,000 years of human history we can find no name with which to answer the question raised in Proverbs. Turning to Pro uh, Psalms 20, 24, 1-4, through 4, 
we will see why no man ascended to heaven through 40 centuries of human history. <clears throat> the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Question. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Answer. He that hath clean hands. No one of Adam's seed ever had hands sufficiently clean, and a pure heart. None of man's offspring have a heart that is pure. All right. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity? All are excluded by that requirement, nor sworn deceitfully. That is not a long list of demands to be met, but throughout the long course of the era we call Old Testament times, no one measured up. When we try to speak <clears throat> with the unsaved or the carnal about righteous living, they reject the notion they are a sinner, which uh, would reply such as, I've never killed anybody, or I would never commit adultery. They name what they think to be huge sins, reasoning within themselves that to transgress the smaller commands would not matter to God. <clears throat> oh, but how wrong they and we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yet here the Lord says, wasting time, a heart only slightly out of tune with the holy, or misusing the gift of speech, are enough to exclude one from his presence. Hmm. Some sins we may have avoided, but there is not a person alive who could say, "I never have never wasted the time of God, uh, the time God gave me." None could fa uh, factually state that the talents, the opportunities, the very life given us have never been misused. Right? We misuse that all the time. Only Jesus Christ could say, I do always those things that please my Father. This is a more incredible declaration than a casual glance reveals. He did not say he had never done anything bad. He said that he had never failed to do something good. Men measure righteousness by not doing wrong. That is only half the equation. If we measured righteousness by doing what is right, who could say... I I have never missed the mark. All right. If we allow God to set the standard, then it is certain there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7.20 When comparing our conduct or lack thereof to the word of the Lord, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Proverbs 20 verse 9 None did ascend, and no man's son did ascend. For there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10 In every life there is a failure to live completely for the honor and glory of God. While one man's hands may not be as dirty as the next man's hands, and while one woman's heart may not have gone as far astray as the next woman's, all of us have proven unworthy of ascension. Moving to Isaiah fourteen twelve through 15 let us consider again the fall of the anointed cherub. Beginning at verse 12, we read, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? It is a declaration, not a question. How art thou cast down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? God exclaiming for all to hear. Right. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Here is the only record we have of someone seeking to ascend, whether or not he uh, he had the power to do so, we cannot tell, but there are a number of facts per, uh, pertinent to our discussion that must be noticed. Number one is, to ascend, he had to go upward past the clouds. Two, to ascend, he had to go upward past the stars. 
three once ascended, he would sit upon a mountain. And number four, once ascended, he would be surrounded by an assembly. Number five, if he did ascend, it would be evidence that he was like the Most High. That he failed in these ends is evident, but we should not overlook what we learn about ascending from the passage. One begins on the earth, rises past its atmosphere, and seeks a place above the stars to sit in the dwelling place of God as an equal with the majesty on high. When put in those terms, it is not only obvious that no man could accomplish such a feat, but one could, would have to be delusional to even consider it possible. <clears throat> and he has a little note down here, says at the bottom of the page, This is not the time to discuss the teachings and followers of Joseph Smith, but the Mormons have indeed fallen under such strong delusion. Right. <laughs> that they have. <clears throat> The parallel passage to this, failed, uh, to this failed attempt at ascension is equally important, for it discusses the person who saw, uh, thought himself worthy. Right. Think carefully upon what is actually said of Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, 12-18, for it may surprise you. Thus saith, the, uh, thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was a complete, inwardly and outwardly, as any being ever created by God. So again, he was as complete, inwardly and outwardly, as any being ever created by God. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He was a wonder to behold, and his very voice was song and music. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was highly positioned and well trusted by his Lord. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Then something failed inside him. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. He was found to be in violation of the ways and purposes of Jehovah. Sin was committed. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. His holiness was gone. His being had lost its glory. The perfect was now profane. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. When will we read of the murder, the theft, the adultery, the making of an idol, the assault upon a child? What terrible thing did he do to bring about such judgment? Ah, the case is much different than men would expect. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Hmm. The fall was not because of a deed done. The ruin did not result from an outward action. But pride was found in his heart. God had made him splendid. God had given him exceeding favors. But he did not like to retain God in his knowledge, and believe that he, the creature, should be enthroned as though he had no creator. Mm. Yikes. And what follows is, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. That's corruption. I will cast thee to the ground, debasing. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Humiliation. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee. Destruction. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. 
This description perfectly matches the fall, which is duplicated in the sons of Adam, according to Romans 1, 20-32. If a created being, as incredible as Lucifer, was unworthy to ascend because of pride in the heart, without any outward transgression read into the account, then it should be evident that no man, repeat, no man is fit to ascend, for all have more than a touch of pride within them. Right, we all have pride within us. We move now to Acts 2. We now know that David died in faith, Psalm 32 and Hebrews 7, 32. He is held forth as an example of those who are saved by grace through faith, Romans 4. Because God has imputed righteousness unto them, yet the Bible says of him in Acts two thirty four through thirty five, David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on, oh excuse me, my right hand, until I make thy fo foes thy footstool. This is not a statement that David was not saved for such would contradict the plain teaching of Scripture regarding him. We know that the Old Testament saints were safe in paradise, awaiting the atonement made for their sins by the Lord Jesus. We know that he escorted the Old Testament saints into heaven after his resurrection, so the statement here proves our point. Even those declared righteous by God's grace could not ascend. They could be transported, translated, carried up, but they could not enter by themselves. Right. Think with me of the blessed hope, Brother James says. Think of me of the blessed hope held by those who have put their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ our Savior. We know that those washed in the blood of the Lamb are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. Looking forward to that day. Maybe it'll happen today. Never know. He will descend from heaven with a shout, and we shall live, leave this old world and travel to the land that is fairer than day. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18 Yet, here we see again that ascension is not possible for any who have sinned, even if those sins have been pardoned and cleansed. The Lord must descend, we must meet him, and he must take us to heaven. We only enter on his merits. Right, not on our own merits, his merits. All right, now we continue on here. It says, having seen that any sin at any time, pardon or not, prohibits one from ascending, we turn our attention to the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, Jesus Christ the Lord. In John 6, he puts forth a teaching about his body and blood that has of offended some and confused others. The response is of interest to us. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? John six sixty one through 62 He calls himself the Son of Man in reference to his hum uh, humanity. But he says that if he goes up, it will be a return to the place where he did abide before he came to earth. Amen. He is uh, stating for all to hear that his life predates his birth in the manger. But he also, also boldly asserts that he will ascend. No man can ascend. This man says he will. When Lucifer sought to ascend, he was cast down in judgment. This man is confident he will not only die and rise again, but stand upon, upon the Mount of Olives and go up to the realms of glory without aid or transport. He states without apology that for him the pearly gates will open, that he will be welcomed on his own merits, and that he will be given his rightful place at the Father's side. Such a thought was sin when it arose in the heart of the covering cherub, such a notion would be pure folly should it cross the mind of any other man. But this man said that he would go from earth to heaven without angels, chariots, escort, or savior. 
none would need to introduce him or advocate on his behalf, he would be sufficiently righteous. He would belong there. Amen. It is important that we keep in mind that Jesus did not say he would ascend as the Son of God, though he is God the Son, but that he would go up as the Son of Man. Look in John 20, and we will read portions from uh, verses 19 through 27, where it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of or for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, and stood in the midst, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, or so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Amen. Why would he show them his hands and side? How would that convince them that he was their master and friend? Why did they not recognize him without looking upon him in this way? But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. The only way this could have happened, as it is recorded, is if the wounds and Jesus' hands were still open. The only way to take this passage is to understand that the wound in his side had not been closed. Both of these truths mean that there had indeed been a resurrection. And Brother James says here, I do not mean to be condescending by stating the obvious, but most Christians give very little thought to the word of God and the things they profess to believe. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So here we have, A body was prepared in the womb of Mary the Virgin. God the Son, the Word, took up residence in that body. He, God, was manifest in the flesh. He lay in a manger. That body grew through infancy, childhood, into manhood. That body was nailed to the cross. That body was taken down and placed in a tomb. After three days and nights, his soul and spirit re-entered that body, and he walked out of the grave alive. This is what resurrection means. He did not appear in a different form. He did not show himself spiritually as some falsely uh, allege. He was alive, spirit, soul, and body, after death as before. You cannot put your finger in the nail hole left in the hand of a spirit. Right. You cannot put your hand in the open wound in the side of a ghost. That is true, too. See, touch, handle, know that the one who died upon the cross is alive. He lived as a man, died as a man, and rose as a man. It is vital that we understand that the Lord did not stop being God when he was manifest in the flesh. But he never stopped being manifest in the flesh once he became man. He left that body for three days and three nights, and then he moved back into it. And we must get ahead of ourselves for just a moment. In the same body that was nailed to the cross, Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Say what you will about Thomas. He had provided us with infallible proof of the resurrection of Jesus. All right. We move on to John 20, verses 11 through 17. And it says, This is the morning of Jesus' resurrection. Mary stood without in the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see it two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. 
And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou had borne, or have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. She is looking for the dead body. She has no anticipation that the Lord would be risen from the dead. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And then he has a little note down here at the bottom, really quick. Uh, note, note number four in this uh, chapter. It says, Jesus said in John twenty or ten twenty seven, My sheep hear my voice, <clears throat> and I know them, and they follow me. She did not recognize him, but when he spoke her name, she knew him. It is uh, so for us today. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans ten seventeen. <clears throat> For we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. All right, that was a little point down there at the bottom. And now we continue on. It says, Now watch carefully. Yes, watch carefully. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Jesus declares that by his own power he is going to enter heaven. He states that he is about to leave earth and visit the Father's house on his merits. No one is coming to take him up. There is no escort. By his righteousness he will ascend. He has been made a man. He has lived as a man. He has died as a man. That man has risen from the grave. That man was holy and is holy. That man was sinless in life and sinless in death, so now he has the right to enter heaven, for he is worthy. Amen. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, Jesus has such hands, and a pure heart, Jesus has such a heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, Jesus has never done so nor sworn deceitfully, he is the truth. The man Christ Jesus will travel from earth to yon fair city and be welcome there, for he is worthy. Glory, glory to his name. There is more to the 24th Psalm just quoted. All right, there is more to the 24th Psalm just quoted. It is not only set forth the requirements for ascension, but anticipated the day when one should so uh, would so arrive, the prophecy called for one to reach the gates of glory and the doors of the throne room on high and be welcomed as a conquering monarch. Behold the words which foretold the return to heaven of the one who had triumphed over sin, Satan, death in the grave. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah, Psalm 24, 7-10. Selah indeed. Oh, to have beheld that scene. All right. None can muster su sufficient thoughts to comprehend the sorrow and anguish when all was darkened and the beloved Son of God was hanging as a worm upon the cross, made sin for us and forsaken of his Father. And having sunk to such depths of woe, we now soar to equal, yea, greater heights as that obedient Son returns with triumph upon triumph. The Father's will is done. Hallelujah. The sin debt is paid. Hallelujah. Death is subdued. Hallelujah. Eternal redemption is obtained. Hallelujah. 
The grave has no sting. Hallelujah. The sun is home. Hallelujah. All heaven rings with song, with shouts of joy, with hurrahs of praise. He is honored. He is adored. He is loved. He is praised. Hosanna in the highest. This time from those who comprehend. Oh, to linger here a while and to think on these things. Amen. But we must revisit the Lord's words to Mary before we, before he went up that morning. They have caused many who are sound in the faith great con, uh, condernation, consternation as they seem to support the fal false doctrines of liberals, modernists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Muslims, and followers of other religions who deny the deity of Christ. In Jesus' words, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Those on both sides suppose they see a statement of inferiority, a denial of Jesus' place in the Trinity. We have no need to avoid these words. Were they confusing and obscure, they could not overflow the dozens of unmistakable declarations of de G uh, Christ's deity found throughout the Holy Bible. Albeit, they are not obscure or difficult, but fit perfectly into the doctrine we are studying, the ongoing humanity of Jesus, the Son of Man. Right. Here our Lord says to Mary that while on earth, he had a father-son relationship with the Most High, and he states that this relationship will continue when he ascends. While he walked down here, Jesus had a God-man relationship with the Father, and he says that relationship will continue. This is vital. Brother James says, I must repeat that Jesus did not cease to be God, right, when he became man, and he did not cease to be man when he ascended. Thus, we have in heaven a representative member of the human race to live and speak on our behalf in the presence of God. Mankind never enjoyed such a blessing. Right. For thousands of years, men offered up prayers to God and wondered if he heard them. While full development of this idea must await a later chapter, before Jesus' ascension, sin so separated God and man that, oh, excuse me, that there was no promise of, ascent, uh, of access, no biding to come boldly to the throne of grace. Now a believer is promised unbroken communion with the Lord, for someone sits in heaven on our behalf who is God, but who made himself one of us. This changes so many things. Consider just one of them for the time being. In 1 Corinthians 15.22, Jesus Christ is called the last Adam. We have learned that the first Adam was crowned with glory and honor and had dominion over the earth until he fell. When the first Adam sinned, he was driven from the presence of God, put out of the garden, and the heavenly messenger with the flaming sword not only kept the man from returning to his former home, but speaks to all who read the record of the banishment of man from fellowship with his maker. We, when the man, Christ Jesus, drank that bitter cup in a garden and stood on resurrection morning in a garden and Mary supposed him to be the gardener, this was no coincidence, for Jesus had come to restore what Adam lost. In the first Adam all sin and all die and all are sentenced to life and time and eternity separated from God. In the last Adam... All who believe are reconciled, 2 Corinthians 5.18, brought nigh, Hebrews 7.19, enter in, John 10.9, come boldly, Hebrews 4.16, and abide, 1 John 2.27-28, with God. All of this is in and through the person of and owing to the merits of the Son of Man. In our next chapter, we will see what it means to saints on earth to have a man in heaven now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 9.24 Amen.
of all the wonderful hymns given to the church that we might praise and worship our Lord, I know of only two which have the ascension of Jesus as their theme. They are well worth our consideration. The first one is Open Wide Ye Doors, and the words and music are by John Peterson. It says, Open wide, ye everlasting doors, let the King of glory in. Now returning from his earthly wars, he the victory did win. See the rich red wounds he bears, scars of battle now he wears. He has wrested Satan's throne, he must reign and he alone. Rise to meet and welcome him, crown him saints and seraphim. Open wide, ye everlasting doors, let the King of glory in. Now, returning from his earthly wars, he the victory did win. Choiring angels, come and wait before him. He is worthy of thy praise. With all heaven, wor uh, with all heaven worship and adore him. Holy hymns and ants raise. He, the Lamb who bled and died, on the cross was crucified, tasting death for every man. This the great redemptive plan. Conqueror of death and hell, see, he lives and all is well. Open wide, ye everlasting doors, let the King of glory in. Now returning from his earthly wars, he, the victory, did win. Amen. Hmm. And the next one is Look Ye Saints, words by Thomas Kelly and music by William Monk. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now, from the fight returned victorious, every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him, crowns become the victor's brow. Crown the Savior, angels crown him, rich the trophies Jesus brings. In the seat of power enthrone him, while the vault of heaven rings. Crown him, crown him, crown the Savior, King of Kings. Sinners in derision crowned him, mocking the, the Savior's claim. Saints and angels crowd around him, own his title, praise his name. Crown him, crown him, spread abroad the victor's fame. Hark those bursts of acclamation, hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station, oh, what joy the sight affords. Crown him, crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And there we wrap up the chapter with these two great hymns, Open Wide Ye Doors and Love Ye Saints, or Look Ye Saints, sorry, Look Ye Saints. And you should go and listen to these two hymns because they are great to listen to and to sing aloud. Amen. All right, well, that concludes chapter 4. And next time we'll be diving into chapter 5, which is titled, Our Days Man. Our Days Man. Amen. All right. Well, that was it for chapter 4 on the Humanity of Christ uh, book. On the uh, chapter 4, the title was The Ascension of Jesus. Amen. And now let us read today's Baptist Bread devotional, which is pretty good. It is titled Healthy Relationship Part 1 for Saturday, December 15th. Healthy Relationship Part 1. And Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. That man is Jesus. Friends are people we know and trust to be friendly. Kindness is not only demonstrated in kind actions, but also in words and the attitudes conveyed. Thus, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Proverbs 27, 6. It took me a while to understand this, but I think I really finally understand what this says. So, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So, when a friend... Our brother or sister in Christ or somebody that really cares about you, corrects you and admonishes you and tells you that you're doing something wrong against the Lord, we should 
take heed to that, and yes, it may wound us because it's convicting, but we should know that the reason why we are always corrected and told the things to do of the Lord by our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ who are following the Lord, that we should take heed to those things and correct the way that we're going and know that it is the right way and that's why they love us is because they're correcting us and when the enemy tries to deceive us into doing things that are wicked and evil we know that that's bad and it's deceitful amen so friends are people we know and trust to be honest even to the point of challenging and correcting us in a gentle and loving manner when needed Trust is the most basic requirement for a sincere and genuine relationship with someone. A husband cannot trust his wife or a wife that uh, a husband who cannot trust his wife or a wife that doesn't trust her husband are experiencing troubles in marriage. Trust is something that is earned over time but can be erased in a moment. That's so true. No matter what relationship you're in, friend, family member, uh, marriage, so trust is something we see in each healthy relationship of life. If there is no trust, then the relationship is based on pretense, fakery, or fabricated re uh, reputation. If a person doesn't trust the boss, the relationship is not what it sh could be. If the boss does not trust the employee, the relationship is stilted. If a parent does not trust the teacher, the student will pick up on that and the classroom relationship will not be what it should be. The same is true in church. The pastor trusts the deacons and the deacons trust the pastor. Their relationship with each other and the relationship of the leadership with the church and the church with the leadership also must be uh, premised on, premised on trust. And... It says continued, and tomorrow will be Healthy Relationships Part 2. Amen. So, I can read that. I'm not sure if I'll be able to read that tomorrow, so we will cover tomorrow's today. Amen. So, for tomorrow, Sunday, December 16th, is Healthy Relationships Part 2. And it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 7. Sometimes people do not trust others simply because of past experiences. Right. And that can be really, really bad because we can't go on past experiences, whether it was a bad relationship with somebody that was married to another person and that they think that all men and women are the same way and you might meet a godly man or a godly woman that is trying to live godly and all of a sudden you're like, I can't trust you because the last husband that I had or last wife that I had, they couldn't be trusted because I married them and they weren't saved and then I got saved and then they left me because they didn't want to be with me anymore. So then it it really ruins every other relationship I have with everybody else. And you can't go by past relationships because not everybody's like that. And when somebody says that they really want to uh, have a relationship with you, whatever, whatever relationship it is, friend, family, brother and sister in Christ, wife, husband, uh, whatever it may be, you can't, can't go and compare other men or women with uh, all those men and women that you might have been with whether you're a man or a woman, talking to both, uh, both sexes. So can't, can't go and base past relationships on present relationships because uh, you might meet somebody that's godly and trying to live right and trying to help you and trying to encourage you to go the right way and get away from all that wicked stuff, all those wicked, ungodly, secular movies that you might be going and watching and you're uh, being deceived by the devil and you have your friends out there, you know, your worldly friends out there saying, come, come with us, come drink with us, come see a secular ungodly movie with us. You know, it won't be bad, there's nothing bad in it. All of a sudden you see somebody fornicating with somebody and that, that gets in your head, it does. I mean, trust me, once it's in there, it's hard to get rid of it because it's like a broken record. And once you hear that thing, it comes back in and your flesh, your flesh wants it. The devil wants you to have it, it's a snare. And you need to get away from that. And... I can be just as guilty. I'm not saying I'm not, but we need to get away from that stuff and get in the Bible and 
learn how God wants us to live. And when somebody's trying to help us, you know, to live like that, we should take heed to it and and know that they love us, and that's why they want us to have a better walk with the Lord. Amen. We shouldn't go off of past relationships when we start a new relationship. Amen. All right, so again, it says, Sometimes people do not trust others simply because of past experiences, even if nothing wrong or sinful has happened in the new relationship. For example, I had a man tell me, the author says, he said, I had a man tell me one time that he didn't trust preachers. His past experiences that were bad experiences led him to the conclusion that all past preachers were evil. How could a person with that conclusion hope to learn, grow, attend church services, develop healthy relationships? Right. I was so offended by the man's statement, but as a preacher, I knew I wouldn't have the chance to earn the trust of that man, is what this pa uh, preacher says. The relationship was tainted and confused from the very start. Not trusting others is a per personal defense mechanism Forced, uh, focused on preserving our pride and protecting our own ego from future harm. Right. It is a natural human reaction. However, not trusting is based on fear. Fear is not something that we are to live by. The Bible encourages living by faith. Right. We should trust God and we should give it to God. And we know that there's going to be trials and tribulations and there's going to be heartache and hurt and wounds and stuff because that's just how us human beings do things. We tend to hurt one another, probably not meaning so all the time, but we do. But we need to keep trusting God and having faith in God and knowing that he will get us through it. Amen. And living by faith and not by fear because fear is not of the Lord. Amen. So repa uh, replace the fear and the accompanying trust issues with Faith in God. Amen. So let's replace the fear and the accompanying uh, trust issues with faith in God. We fear when we are not in control. Yeah, that's true. We fear when we lose our influence. We fear when we are not sure what is going on. Have faith in God. In big bold letters, let's have faith in God. Fear causes us to doubt the power of God. Right. <laughs> fear causes us to forget the love of God. Yeah, that's true, too. Fear causes us to not think clearly. Right. <laughs> Ask the Lord to help each relationship to be built on trust. Without trust, you don't really have a relationship anyway. Right. No trust, no relationship. End of story. No trust, no relationship. Gotta learn how to trust one another. Gotta learn how to trust God. Can't have a relationship with God if you can't trust Him. Can't have a relationship with another person if you can't trust Him. I mean, yeah, we're gonna hurt each other. Yeah, we're gonna offend each other. Yeah, we're gonna say things that, that you know, come out of our mouths, you know, that we will regret later. But we gotta keep learning how to have healthy relationships and to trust God and to give it to God and and to not keep being fearful and and if there's no trust, there's really no relationship anyway. That's basically what it comes down to. So. Let's learn to trust one another. Let's learn to trust our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's learn to trust our, uh, our whatever, whatever relationship we're in. Amen. Learn to trust one another. Learn to give it to God. Learn to go to God and know that He loves you and that He'll help you through it. Amen. And stop looking on past relationships that might have gone wrong because somebody might have left you or hurt you in some way and... And then you get into a new relationship and then you're not going to trust that person because you think that they're like everybody else. Well... Could be, could not be. Just got to give it a chance. Amen. So there you have it. That is the Baptist bread from today and tomorrow. Amen. So let's learn how to have healthy relationships and learn how to trust God more and have faith in God and know that He can help us through any situation, any trial, any any uh, thing that's bogging us down. Amen. Amen. All right, well... Until next time, this was the Humanity of Christ book reading and the Baptist Bread devotional from today and tomorrow. Amen. And Lord willing, we'll be back soon to give you Chapter 5, Our Days Men. Looking forward to that. Hallelujah. All right. If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today, today, friend, is the day to do so. 
Because the first thing you need to do is believe on what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross, how he went to that cross. He, he was born of a virgin, came into a body of flesh, born of a virgin, and then he lived a human life without sin, and he obeyed every commandment of God, and he's the only one that could do so. And then he didn't just live as a man without sin and, and uh, doing everything that God said, but he went to that cross, and he died for our sins, and he was buried and rose again the third day, according to Scripture. And that is found in 1 Corinthians 15, in the first uh, five or six verses. Amen. So, if you have not done that today, today is the day to do so, because you never know what tomorrow will bring. You never know what the next moment will bring. You could die right now as you're watching this Facebook Live Scope. Amen. And we don't want to see that happen to you, friend. Don't want to see you die in your sin. So put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today. And get in your Bible and learn how He wants you to live and what He wants you to give up. And learn how to live better. But that doesn't save you. That comes after you get saved. You start learning how to live a more Christ-like life while on this work, on, your, on this earth, I should say. On this work, I don't know how to say that. All right, on this earth, and that works does not save you. But yes, we are supposed to strive to be better Christians after we're saved and learn how to give up things and learn how to live more holy and righteous with God's help. Amen. After being saved. So, trust Jesus today and he'll save your soul. All right, well, thanks for watching and back next time, Lord willing. All right, have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Amen.